Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Morning, Calvary Church. We're going to continue our series, the book of Acts. We're going to be reading out of Acts 3 today. The title of the message is Grace is Greater. And we're going to see how grace is greater than all things throughout this chapter. We're going to pick up where we left off in verse 8. So if you missed it pre-service, we already started the sermon. Peter was with the lame man at the beautiful gate, and he lifts him up, and he is healed. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's remember in this chapter who Peter is. If you ever have doubts on if the Lord can use you, just look back in the Gospels at who Peter was and how the Lord is using Peter now. Peter, the one who disowned Jesus three times, said he was not associated with him, had nothing to do with Jesus after following him for three years. The one who passionately always was the first to speak up in the Gospels, whether he was completely right or whether he got the answer completely wrong. And we see Peter's mistakes throughout the Gospels. Yet, the Lord chooses to use him in these mighty works and mighty ways. Your limitations can't limit the working of our God. Your past can't limit the working of the Holy Spirit to move through you. All we have to do is say yes and be obedient to the Holy Spirit working through us to see the works that he wants to do. Now we see this great mighty miracle at the beginning of Acts 3. And so I want to take just a quick moment to talk about the theology of healing. Healing is a spiritual gift that we, we read about, and it is for today. The Lord still moves. The Lord still heals. The Lord still does mighty miracles today. Our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Lord desires for us to go and walk in these works. And when we walk in the works, things may happen. Mighty miracles may happen. But nowhere in Scripture will it be found that the Lord desires to heal all people of their physical illness of their physical limitations. He doesn't desire to lift all people up out of the, the physical circumstances they, they may be in. If everybody comes to the altar for healing in a day, everybody might get healed, but Scripture doesn't say that that's actually going to happen. The Lord does tell us what his desire is for all people, though. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, it says this, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. His desire is that all people would be saved and have a knowledge of truth. Now there's times and there's moments here on earth where we, we get an impartation of heaven and we get to work and we get to see a miracle. We get to see the glory of the Lord show up in a specific moment. His desire, though, is for us to receive the grace is greater than the things and the miracles and the works that happen. Everybody will be healed in eternity. Everybody will be healed when the Lord comes back. So either upon death and entering into eternity or when Jesus comes back and he sets his feet back on this earth and he rules as a reigning king and he enters back. It's, we're going to read in Acts 3, it's called the time of refreshing when the Lord comes back and he restores creation to what it was in the garden. At that point, there's healing. But in this time, we have moments where we see heaven imparted. But it's not for every single instance, every single person is going to be healed. No, but every single person the Lord desires to have relationship with, to have salvation, for them to have the truth Let's continue in verse 10. They recognize him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. 
and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Whatever this looks like in your life, put on display how the Lord has changed you. For this man, it was obvious and easy. He was able to stand up. He was able to walk, jump, and praise the Lord for the first time in his life. And they were amazed. However the Lord has changed your life, it's up, it's up to you, it's up to us to put that on display for people to see you living a changed life according to the gospel. When you do that, people are drawn in. People see the working of the Lord in your life. And then you have the opportunity to share with them why you are living a changed life, why you are a new person, why you are a new creation. Put on display how the Lord changes you. Let us read John 14, verse 12. So we're going to talk about the the works that the Lord has for us to do. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So Jesus is there. Jesus is with the Father. And so now there's works for us to continue doing and greater works than him. Sounds sounds crazy. Sounds like God has greater things for us to do than what Jesus did. I believe the miracle in Acts 3 is one of these acts, one of these works that Jesus is referring to because he went to the Father. So now is a chance for the Apostle Peter to work, to walk in these works that the Lord has set for him. This is a little bit of biblical conjecture. It is not written in Scripture that Jesus walked by the lame man at the gate. So just leading into it, and no, a, a warning. This is, this is putting together some scriptures on what most likely happened, but it's not directly written in scripture. Let's put some things together. Luke chapter 22, verse 53 says, Every day, Jesus, every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is the hour, your hour, when darkness reigns. So this is when Jesus was getting arrested. And Jesus says every day he was in the temple courts. When he showed up to Jerusalem for Holy Week, he was there. He went to the temple every single day to pray. Matthew 21, verses 14 and 15 says the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna, Son of David, they were indignant. Wow, notice who's praising the Lord there. What a need for ministries like CEF to be in the schools. The children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the Son. And that's what they're doing next door in children's church. What a beautiful thing to know and to see. And how the children's praise and worship moving the the workers and the, the leaders of the law. But what is verse 14 is the key. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and they were healed. So the lame beggar at the temple gate says that he was put there every single day to beg and ask for money. Yet there's other lame men being carried in by their friends into the temple and he's going to see them walking out. Yet he doesn't go into the temple All the way, he has no expectation for Jesus to actually heal him. Showing up was only half of the battle, but he had no expectation to actually go and meet Jesus and have his life changed. I believe that the Lord, I believe Jesus left this assignment specifically there for Peter. That Jesus didn't heal him as Jesus walked by the lame beggar at the gate knowing that it was going to be for Peter in the future. It was a good work put there by Jesus in advance. You see, if, we, if you look at a map of the temple, we know that 
the beautiful gate where the lame man was put every single day was the east gate. We also know that in scripture, Jesus and his disciples didn't stay in the temple every single night. Like they, they didn't stay in the city of Jerusalem every single day. They went into the city. They went into the temple every day to pray and to heal people, to perform miracles. But then every evening they left and they stayed on the Mount of Olives. Now, if you walk outside of the beautiful gate and you look, you walk straight into the Mount of Olives. Ironically, where Jesus stayed was east of the beautiful gate, which was the east gate. So likely, the beautiful gate being the largest entrance where most people went in and out of and just the direct line for Jesus to go into the temple, Jesus likely walked right by this lame man every single day going into the temple to perform works and to heal and to, to preach and to share and to teach. But yet he didn't, when walking by him, heal this man. Why? I believe it was for this moment and these works. There are works for us. John chapter 9, 1 through 7 begins teaching us these things. As he went along, he saw, Jesus saw a blind man from birth. He disciple, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. Remember that phrase, the works of God will be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, put it in the man's eyes, and told him, go, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and was washed, and he came home seeing. There are some points there. Jesus says that he must do the works these are things that the Lord has called us to do, and I believe there are specific things that the Lord has planned for you, for I, for everybody individually in their life, specific works that he has for you. Also, Jesus put the mud in his eye, that holy mud, with Jesus spit on it, told him to go, the blind man, go and wash it in the pool. Now the man is still blind. How did he get there? Somebody has to guide him. Somebody has to guide him in the direction and the will that Jesus called for his life, told him to do. This is a picture of the church. When people come and they meet Jesus and they, they're saved, it's not congratulations, you met Jesus. Hope you, hope you figure everything out. Jesus has chose the church to come alongside people, to walk with them, and to help, help them learn what Scripture says so that they can figure out the will of God for their life and find the works that God has called for them to do, to learn what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus. We're going to see 40 people get baptized after service. It's up to the church to come alongside of them and walk with them. It's not be baptized, congratulations, I hope you learn how to read the Bible all by yourself. We're supposed to walk with people. If you're a new believer, you're not supposed to walk by yourself. Don't think that you're in this race, this, this walk of faith by yourself. Find somebody that's willing to take time and disciple you. This church is full of people that should be ready to walk alongside of you and help you figure out what the works of God are for your life. Let's continue that, that, this teaching in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The lame man at the beautiful gate, I think Jesus left him there as a plan in advance for Peter to walk into. Why do we disciple people? So that they can come to this understanding and figure out what the works are that they are supposed to walk into in their lives. Because Jesus has good works for them to walk into. 
when you came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you weren't instantly beamed up to heaven or else we wouldn't be here. There's, he has a plan and a will for your life. He has good works for you to do to walk in in advance. He's gone before you and planned these things that he wants you to do so that other people would come to saving knowledge. And when you walk in those things, it's not for your glory. When you do those things and those works, however it manifests, it might be a mighty miracle. It might be a little conversation over coffee. When people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the glory of God is displayed in them. Just like the blind man. Not for your neighbor to walk in. Not for Pastor Ryan to walk in. Not for other disciples to walk in. Good works for you to walk in. There's works out there that only you can do. That the Lord has planned for you to do. Not for other people. Know that the Lord has a perfect plan and will for you. And there's people out there ready to receive Jesus. There's a harvest ready of people ready to receive Jesus. But Jesus has done a crazy thing. And he decided to use the church to spread his gospel. He can do it all on his own. He still does at times. There's stories of Jesus meeting people right in their dreams. But in general, the, the plan of Jesus in scripture, he tells us to go make disciples of all nations. He's chosen the imperfect people to go spread his gospel. He's chosen you, an imperfect person that has accepted Jesus to go spread his gospel and to do the mighty works that he's planned for you. And when we do those things, sometimes crowds gather. This is why I think that specific work was meant for Peter. Because as soon as the miracle is done, a crowd is gathered. And the greater miracle then begins to happen. In verse 11, while the man was holding on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade or Solomon's Porch. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power, our godliness, we made this man walk? We know it's by the power of God that this man was healed. A little bit more of the uh, healing theology is we know we go pray. That's out of obedience, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit that people get, is how people get healed. And our instruction is to pray over people in the name of Jesus and it's done according to the will of the Father. God heals. Our God is a Trinitarian God. We pray in the name of the Son. It's by the will of the Father and by the power of the Holy Spirit, working simply through your obedience. And Peter continues his gospel presentation. Some of these words may sound familiar from the Acts 2 gospel presentation. Peter does the, similar, the same thing. He, he's not afraid to put people's sin directly in their face. So that they see it, they feel guilty, and then they receive the grace. Gospel presentations, should not, sin should not be left out of it. Our Lord is a loving Lord, but people need to know what sin is. And it separates them from the Father. He says, you handed him over to be killed. Your sin. You disowned him before Pilate. Though he decided to let him go, you disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who, who you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has made completely healed him. And you all can see it. Verse 17, Peter begins to temper down a little bit. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. All for this, verse 19, repent then and turn to God so your sins would be wiped out. It's okay for us to read God's word and be confronted by the reality of our sin. Scripture says that we are all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. But regardless of whatever your past and whatever your sin is, whatever the, the list and the resume of your sin, 
Jesus takes it and his blood rips it up and says, repent and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out. As we read earlier, it's not by our works. It's nothing we can do. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But it's a free gift of God. Salvation. Just repent. Turn to God so that your sins would be wiped out. Verse 19 again, repent then and turn to the God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Understand this, the repentance, the grace, and the gift is way more important than the miracle that we saw at the beginning of the chapter. The miracle was just to draw the, draw the attention, draw the attention of the people. The miracle without the presentation of the gospel is just the work. It's nothing. It doesn't matter. It's not life saving. It's not life saving. It's not eternally saving anybody. Just the miracle. There are miracles. There are good works for us to do. But when you walk in them and you do them and you walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, don't forget what is way more important. Way more important to follow that up with a presentation of God's grace. Let us finish the chapter. Verse 24. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to them, Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he, he sent him first to you to bless, bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. That the point for we, us to repent and turn from our wicked ways. It's way more important than the work. It, it's way more important than the miracle is the repentance, is the grace, is the gospel of Jesus. And, this, and let's see one last example in Mark 6, 1 through 6. Jesus' own proof, Jesus' own, own word about it. Verse 1, he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters with us, here with us? And they took offense at him. They were astonished by a grown adult Jesus coming back and the things he was doing and the, the wisdom he was teaching until they realized who he was. Wait, isn't this Jesus? Don't we know him? Didn't we see him grow up? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He could do no mighty work except heal some people, except perform some miracles, people getting their, the physical needs met, seeing astonishing things just like in Acts 3. But the difference between Nazareth and the story in Acts 3 is that Nazareth didn't receive Jesus as the Messiah standing right before them. And Jesus said no mighty work could be done there because the mighty work of Jesus is the, is the salvation, is, the, is him taking us out of our sin and giving us eternal life and relation, relationship with the Father. That's the mighty work. If we, if we walk in works, if we walk and do the things that the Lord has called you to do, you go find those divine appointments that he's set for you in advance this week. 
and the power of God, his glory is put on display in their lives, but then we don't share the truth of how that glory works, how the grace works, Jesus' own words, it's no mighty work at all. Don't forget what is way more important. Worship team, you can come on out. We're going to have a time of response. Pastor Ryan did an amazing job. I felt like I didn't even need to come up here and preach a sermon because he came up and gave the gospel presentation and time of prayer. And so if, if you are confronted by the reality of your sin, it's okay. The Holy Spirit is there to do that in conviction. All that's needed is your response to repent so that those sins would be wiped out. Jesus already paid for it. His blood paid for it on the cross to wash you clean. Repent and receive Jesus. If you missed that chance at the beginning of the message, during this time of response, I'll be here in the front. I would love to pray with you. But also there's a second response I believe that we we should respond to today. And it's the readiness and the boldness and the willing to go walk in the works that Jesus has prepared for you in advance. How do we do that? It's by the filling and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you try and go take on spiritual warfare or you try and do the works that the Lord has for you in your own strength and your own power, you will be unsuccessful. It is not by your own strength or your own power. It's by the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit that we do things. And it will look different for all of you. It will look different for all of us. Some, some manifestations, some works might be mighty miracles like we see here in Acts 3. It could be a wide array of things. But no matter what it is, we walk and we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we receive the power of the Holy Spirit? We're going to see it again and again in the book of Acts Paul comes to the group of people and he asks if they received the power of the Holy Spirit and and it's by prayer. It's by the gathering and prayer of God's people that they are empowered to go with the Holy Spirit to walk in the works prepared for them. And so if you are ready to be empowered by the Holy Spirit or you need to be refilled, even the Apostle Paul talks about it in his writings. Pray for me. Paul says it. The Apostle Paul says, pray for me that I be refilled. After doing mighty miracles, he says, pray that I be refilled. If you have not been filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, the the altar and the prayer team will be here to pray with you. That is what they're doing here at the front. They're praying with you that you would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to go and work, do the works that the Lord has for you. If you've been filled and you need to be refilled to continue to work, ask for the Lord to refill you. There's no limitation. It's not a one and done thing. You might have come across a divine appointment and done the work of the Lord and he's got another one for you this afternoon. He's got another one for you on Tuesday and Thursday. And then when we gather again here next Sunday, you get to tell the people sitting on your left and your right, I had this appointment that the Lord set for me and this happened. This miracle happened. This conversation happened. This person received hope when they were in a desperate time in their life and they had given up on life. And they they had no hope and now they have the hope of Jesus because you walked in the power of the Holy Spirit and you walked into those appointments and those works that Jesus prepares for you in advance. So when when the band is playing, there's a time of of response. If you want prayer, the, the altar team will be here to pray with you. And if you want to receive the free gift of grace, I, Pastor Ryan, will be over here as well to pray with you if you're wanting to receive salvation. Lord, thank you for your word and your message. I pray that you would move on the hearts of your people, that we would be sensitive to the guiding and the leading of your Holy Spirit, that when we're walking about doing our day-to-day things, we would see the appointments that you have placed for us in advance, just like, just like Peter walking to the temple. It wasn't on his agenda, to pray for the lame beggar. 
but he, he followed the guiding of your spirit. He saw the work that needed to be done. And I pray as we go this week that we would see the works, your works that need to be done because the harvest is ready. Would you bold in your church? Would you empower your people? In Jesus' name, amen.